Let's study sense organs. 10th standard ICSE biology chapter 11. We have our five senses, external senses, and many other sense organs inside our body. In this chapter, we are going to study about two very important sense organs, the eyes and the ears. They are the gateway to the outside world. Now, we know that the sense organs are simply an apparatus to capture the stimuli or the information from the outside and convert it into electrochemical impulses via the receptor cells and then send it via the nervous system to our spinal cord or our brain where it is processed and we make sense of it and then we take any action if required. So the receptors are of a few types. We have mechanoreceptors which are for touch, pressure, etc. For example, the ones in the skin. Then we have chemoreceptors which are there in the taste buds of a tongue and even in a nose to smell things. Phonoreceptors, sorry, photoreceptors are present in the rods and the cones of the retina of the eye, which are sensitive to light. Thermoreceptors are sensitive to temperature changes. So there are heat and cold receptors in our skin, of course. And then we have phonoreceptors. There is a receptors for sound or hearing, and obviously they are in our ears. Let's talk about the eye. That's a pretty eye. There's only one eye here because after the painter finished painting one eye, he was so mesmerized by it that he went blind and couldn't finish the second eye's painting. The eyes are fit in a cavity called orbit. So there are two sockets in the head. If you notice, there is, if, you see, if you've seen a skull, it does not have any eyes, rather they have a hole in them. That's called the orbit in which the eyes are fixed and it can be moved with the help of special muscles. The eyelids, upper and lower ones, are movable and they protect us from light, dust, etc. Even the eyelashes have two functions. One is to protect us from particles and also to attract others, especially after having put mascara on it. Eyebrows, they also protect us. Uh, for example, if perspiration or sweat is falling down, the eyebrows block it and prevent it from entering your eye. Then we have the tear glands, also called the lacrimal glands, which produce tears. Now, the liquid produced by them is produced in excess when we are very emotional, for example, sad, but sometimes even when we are happy. But this liquid is secreted on a regular basis in small quantities because apart from expressing emotion it has other functions for example it lubricates the movement of the eyelids so that there is less friction it washes away the dust particles from the eye surface regularly and it also has an enzyme called lysozyme which kills all the germs this lacrimal gland along with this na this nasolacrimal duct is a reason why the eye drops can sometimes enter our throat via the nasolacrimal duct and we can taste the, the eye drops. Now let's study the structure of the eye. You need to practice how to draw this. So first draw a huge circle and then draw a small circle lightly and then start detailing the image. So as you can see, the outermost layer is conjunctiva. This is actually not a part of the eyeball. It is continuous with the eyelids on top and at the bottom. It's very thin and it's transparent, of course. If the conjunctiva is infected, then we say we have a conjunctivitis. That's when the eyes become red. And no, sta staring at such an eye won't infect you. That's not how viruses jump from one eye to the other. There should be actual contact directly or indirectly. So the actual eyeball has three layers. The outermost layer is called the sclerotic layer or sclera, which is uh, made up of tough fibrous tissues. It is white in color. So the white of the eye that you see in front is actually a part of the sclera layer. Just in the center in front out here, the sclera becomes transparent and very thin. That part is called the cornea. So you can see the bulge from the side view and the central part which is transparent, that's the cornea which is a part of this 
sclerotic layer. Now it seems colors colored because cornea being transparent, we can see things beneath it. So behind the cornea, we have these muscles, colored muscles called iris. And that's the color which we see in the eye here. If the iris is green, that means your eyes appear to be green. The iris is a part of the second layer called the choroid layer. So that's the second layer. Now notice that cornea is supposed to be transparent, but sometimes due to some deformity, it may become opaque, that is white. And then you become blind because if the cornea is opaque, then how will light enter inside and how would you see? This disorder is called corneal opacity, which can be corrected through surgery. Um, we can have eye donation to give our cornea after death to blind people. In fact, the cornea of a dead person can be sliced into several layers and it can give sight to many people. So the second layer, the choroid layer, is richly supplied with blood for nourishment and it has a dark pigment called melanin. So the second layer prevents the light from light rays from reflecting and scattering inside the eye. And in continuation with this layer, we have the iris, which has pigments of various colors. Usually it's brown or black. Sometimes it can be blue or green as well. It's genetic. We also have another extension of this layer, of the choroid layer, called the ciliary body, which holds the eye lens in its position. This eye lens is a convex lens. It's quite a flexible lens, unlike the glass lenses which we use in our cameras. This one can change its shape and hence the focus. So when light rays fall on it, its function is to converge the rays of light so that a point image can be formed on the third layer, the innermost layer called the retina, which, is, which acts like a screen inside this camera called the eye. If you notice, there is a gap in between here, which is called the pupil. That's where light enters the eye. So right here in the center, you will see a black hole, which is the opening for the light to enter inside the eye. And the size of this pupil varies with the intensity of light falling on it. If it's too bright, then the pupil will be constricted so that less light is falling on the retina. Otherwise, it will get damaged. And in darkness, the pupils will dilate. Now, if I just enlarge this diagram, suppose this is the iris right in the center of the eye, and this is the pupil. Iris is made up of muscles, so we have some radial muscles and some circular muscles. Now the radial muscles, they constrict in order to dilate the pupil, so then the pupil becomes dilated and more light can enter inside the eye and fall on the eye lens. This happens in a dark room. Whereas the circular muscles, they make sure that the pupil is constricted, that it becomes small. This happens in bright sunshine or bright light. So we can change the size of our pupil and this happens automatically. This helps us in light and dark adaptation. For example, if you're in a, in a dark theater for a long time and suddenly you come out in broad daylight, then the pupil size will constrict to prevent excessive light to fall on the retina suddenly. So you are adapting to the light, which takes a few moments. In the meanwhile, you'll just shut your eyes. On the other hand, if from a lighted area, you enter a dark room, for the first few seconds, you can't see things clearly. But then you start seeing the, the silhouette or the borders or the shadows of things, you can actually find your way through a room, even in darkness. So your eyes have now become adapted to darkness. But how does that happen? Well, first of all, the pupil dilates, allowing more light to enter your eye, which takes a few seconds. So that's why you are not able to see in the dark room immediately. Try it. Switch off all the lights and the curtains and see if you're able to see anything for the first few seconds. And this pattern of all these muscles in the iris is very unique for each person, just like your fingerprints. That is why the iris scan is a good biometric way of identifying a person. Now the innermost layer, as I said, is the retina. 
the retina has some receptor cells sensitive to light there are two types rods and cones because of the shape of the cells respectively and their functions are different remember cones are responsible for color vision and rods are responsible for dark vision most of the cones are concentrated in a small area on the retina which is called fovea centralis also the yellow spot also called macula luteum that is the area of the best vision so when you are reading okay if you focus on one word say just focus on this word emotional states okay don't look anywhere else just focus on this word emotional states now even though you are focusing here you can actually see the in the most of the page here you can see the top part the part over here no don't look there keep focusing on emotional states so you can see that there there are sentences above and below it but you can't actually read them right now because your entire focus is on emotional states you can see that there is a diagram of the eye out here but you can't read the labelings yet it's not very clear because you're focusing here only when you move your eyesight move your head and now focus on this diagram now you are able to see all of it right but now you can't read the emotional states words you you know that there's something bold out here but your focus is out here so what's happening is that only this part of the page is forming an image on that sweet spot the yellow spot the area of best vision the image of the rest of the page is being formed on the retina but that is not the area of your best vision there are hardly any cones out there there are more of, more of rods at the periphery of the retina so you can see them somewhat but it's not clear to you so at night when you enter a dark room you can see the bed you can see your hands and the table but you won't be able to see the color of things you can only see the silhouette or the boundary boundaries of these things and you are aware that there is a bed in your room although it's dark you can see the boundary of the bed but you can't see the color of the bed sheet that's because in darkness the cones are not activated they need a lot of light to be activated and cones are required for color vision at night in the dim light only the rods are activated so they can just give you dark vision the black and white vision they can't give you color vision so now you know the difference between them another difference is that rods have a pigment called rhodopsin and cones have a pigment called iodopsin so when you are exposed to bright light the rhodopsin of the rod cells are degenerated or bleached rhodopsin is also called visual purple so that becomes inactive in, in bright light because at that time the cones are the most active now suddenly if you enter a dark room then you're not able to see clearly i told you the reason is that your pupils were constricted so they need to dilate first of all to allow more light to enter inside but not only that you see in a dark room there is less light available so the cones are of no use you can't see things with just the cones you want the rods to be activated first and that will take a few seconds for the rhodopsin which was earlier bleached in bright light to be regenerated and once the rods rhodopsin are regenerated in dark room you will now be able to see the black and white surroundings so this is called dark adaptation on the other hand light adaptation is the opposite of this so as soon as you enter bright light what happens your pupils get constricted because you don't want so much light to fall on it and at the same time the rods become less active favoring now the use of cones which will give you color vision in broad daylight now just like we have an area for the best vision which is called the yellow spot we also have a spot called the blind spot which is where the optic nerve starts so since the optic nerve which carries the signals of vision to the brain and that's how we see yeah we see with the brain not with the eye eye is just an apparatus to capture the information and send it to the brain and the brain has to interpret it so here there are no retina cells so if the image is formed here we won't be able to see it which is surprising that the object is right in front of us and yet you won't be able to see it because uh, of this blind spot it's like if there is a cctv camera uh, in some hall and a person is standing right below the cctv camera the cctv camera can't capture the image of that person so there are some restrictions in any image being formed and whatever cannot be seen 
that area is called the blind spot. There is an ex experiment to experience your own blind spot, so you can do it. It's fun. Now, as far as the lens is concerned, it is held with the help of suspensory ligaments. So here we've got two things. We've got the suspensory ligaments which hold the lens in position. And we have the ciliary muscles which can change the shape of lens. So remember these two different functions. We also see that there is some transparent fluid like substance, a jelly-like substance filled here, which is called the aqueous humor. And similarly, a jelly-like substance filling this entire eyeball called the vitreous humor. The vitreous chamber has vitreous humor and the aqueous chamber has aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is transparent, of course. That is why the light will pass through it and it will get refracted. They will converge. So the cornea, the lens and the aqueous humor, all of them converge light onto the retina. The vitreous humor gives shape to the eye. Imagine without it, if it was hollow, the eye could just collapse so easily. They are also protective in nature. The aqueous humor keeps the eye lens moist and the vitreous humor protects the nerve endings of the retina cells. Now let's try the power of accommodation. When you are looking at something far away, the rays of light can be imagined to be parallel to each other. So they are refracted at the cornea, again refracted at the lens. It should be refracted twice, which they have not shown properly. So this diagram is not perfect. But just understand that finally it makes a point image on the retina. Yeah, it's inverted image by the way. Yes, everything you see, uh, the image is inverted on your retina. But thanks to the brain, you see it erect. So the lens is quite thin here, so that the focal length is long enough. But what if you're seeing something which is very nearby? Then you need a smaller focal length. You want it to converge a lot. So one convergence takes place at the cornea, which is very slight. The major convergence happens with this fat, thickened eye lens. And so we get a proper image. Otherwise, uh, the image will be very blurry. So we can change the shape or we can change the focal length of the eye lens thanks to the ciliary muscles. So ciliary muscles contract making it thick when we're seeing a nearby object and that's when the suspensory ligaments are relaxed. But if you're seeing something very far away, then the ciliary muscles relax, whereas the suspensory ligament tightens up so that the convex lens is thin. Then I've talked about the light and dark adaptation. Color vision is because of the cones. They actually have sensitivity towards three colors, red, violet, in fact, red, green and blue. And the combination of red, green and blue gives us the myriad colors which we see in nature. But the primary colors are red, green and blue. RGB, remember that. Now let's study some defects of the eye. First of all, myopia or short-sightedness. What happens here is we can see nearby objects. But when we try to see far away objects, the lens is so curved that the image is formed in front of the retina. So the image formed in the retina is very blurry and you can't see things clearly when it's too far away. It may be also because the eyeball has become compressed. So you see the distance between the lens and the lens and the retina has become more. So it has become compressed from top to bottom and it has become lengthened from front to back. So the distance has become too much and the image is not fall falling on the retina properly. This may simply be because of a part and parcel of your growth. As you grow, your facial bones grow and they press against the eyes and that's how you may have a number. And then you have to wear spectacles. So for myopia, you can wear concave lenses because concave lenses will first diverge them and then the eye lens will converge them. So see here there's a divergence and then there's a convergence. We are not showing any refraction at the cornea. Let's keep it simple. And that's how the image is formed perfectly here. Whereas in hyperopia, which is also called hypermetropia or farsightedness, we can see far away things. But anything nearby, well, now from front and back, the eye has become compressed so that the distance is too less. Or maybe the eye lens is just too thin so that images are formed virtually behind the retina. So a sharp image is not being formed. We want it to be formed earlier. So obviously we need more convergence. So can you guess what kind of lens would be used? in such a spectacle, a convex lens is used. So you can see once the convergence happens here and then draw parallel rays, almost parallel rays and show a second convergence at the eye lens. So please show twice the convergence in the diagram 
here in the textbook the diagram is not correct because they've shown the convergence only here and then it just goes straight which is not possible it converges twice once here and once here so that finally the image is formed here also make sure that the iris that you draw is not blocking the rays of light the pupil should be wide enough for the light to fall on the iris the next disorder is astigmatism that is a condition in which you can see one part of the image clearly but then the second part is not very clear it may be because of some defect with your cornea and it cannot be corrected with the help of spherical lenses you'll have to wear cylindrical lenses and notice that we can only correct all these defects we cannot cure them with the lenses if you want to cure then you have to undergo surgery like uh, a laser surgery next we have presbyopia which affects older people they cannot see nearby objects so it's similar to myopia so they will use in fact it's similar to hyperopia so they will use convex lenses and the reason why they are far sighted is because their lenses have lost the flexibility next condition is the cataract in which the lens turns opaque now if the lens turns opaque again you'll be blind so then you'll have to surgically remove the eye lens so that you can see but then who will converge the rays of light to form an image on the retina well you may have to start wearing specs with very high converging power or you can place or go for a transplant of a plastic eye lens inside your eye or from some eye donated by somebody next the night blindness some people don't have enough rods or they have deficiency of vitamin a due to which the visual purple that is a rhodopsin is not produced in enough quantity so they can't see properly at night at all in dim light that's called night blindness color blindness that's because of the defect in the cones it's a birth defect it's a genetic defect for example there is a simple test can you see 25 number yes good can you see 56 number yes you can can you see 45 yes you can yeah and you can you see 19 yes you can so if you can't see and even one of these numbers then you are color blind sorry you can't see 19 out here uh oh color blindness then so you should not get a driving license because you won't be able to see the signals right next corneal opacity as i explained sometimes the cornea becomes opaque and then they have to undergo surgery some people may have a squint which is called cross-eyed or wide wide-eyed the scientific name is diplopia due to which the, they have double vision they're not able to see clearly and surgery is required to set it straight now we are carnivores actually omnivores so we have both the eyes in front of us if you notice a herbivore has the eyes on the left hand side and the right hand side of their faces for example this herbivore has one eye here where is the second eye it's on the other side so they can see the views which is very different from the way we see they have a wider view because they need to notice if any predator is coming to pounce on them we on the other hand have both the eyes in front of us it gives us binocular vision or stereoscopic vision we can focus on our prey and pounce on it while hunting it gives us a three-dimensional effect we are able to judge how far something is thanks to our binocular vision next after images all of you have seen how a flip book works where the pages are flipped so fast it gives you an impression of something actually moving let me try one version of it if you can feel you can see that this person is jumping up and down ah, it's just two pages but if you do it with many pages you can actually have the effect called persistence of an image because once an image is formed on the retina it lasts for one tenth of a second so even before that image disappears you have a second image and a third image and a fourth image then it's superimposed on each other and it gives you a continuous motion for example right now you can see so many multiple pencil images because multiple images were formed on the retina that's exactly how tv works or any video for that matter even on your phone they are actually just images so many images are being shown to you per second it gives you an illusion of a video in reality there is no such thing as a video it's just continuous images see 24 pictures per second after images also experienced if you look at the sun for a long time roughly and then look somewhere else you can see a yellow spot 
where the sun was supposed to be. So that's because an impression has been created on the retina which lasts for a long time. Now let's talk about the ear. We have the outer ear which has the pinna. Birds don't have the pinna but they have ears. Okay, This pinna is also called auricle. Then we have the auditory canal through which the sound waves are transmitted to the middle ear. The pinna helps to focus all the sound waves into this canal. Rabbits, dogs, they have huge pinnae so that they can collect sound waves. They are very sensitive to sound. Some people can even move their pinnae. What a talent that is. And we have the eardrum, also called tympanum, which vibrates when the mechanical sound waves fall on it. So that's the outer ear. Next we have the middle ear. The middle ear has three bones, the ear ossicles, the malleus, incus and stapes. That is the hammer, the anvil and the stirrup. The stirrup, by the way, is the smallest bone in the human body. And they all function like a liver to amplify the vibrations so that we can hear the sound clearly later on. We also have something called the oval window. As you can see, it's right here next to the stirrup. The oval window is the point of entry for these vibrations to enter the cochlea. We also have a round window at the bottom, the round window, which also allows communication between the middle ear and the inner ear. Finally, we have this eustachian tube. This eustachian tube connects the ear to the throat. It helps to equalize the air pressure on the two sides of the eardrum so that it can vibrate freely. Sometimes, uh, if this eustachian tube is just clogged because of ear wax or something, then the air pressure is not equal and the eardrum does not vibrate clearly. In fact, you feel a bit of pressure on your eardrum or it even pains, especially when you are changing the air pressure suddenly, like in an elevator or in an aeroplane, when the air pressure changes suddenly and you are not able to adjust to it, perhaps it's because of the eustachian tube being, being blocked. In fact, it's totally blocked. You can't even hear anything because eardrums won't vibrate, vibrate properly. That's also the reason why sometimes the ear drops, they may enter your throat and you may taste it. And finally, we have the inner ear. The inner ear is also called the membranous labyrinth. It's such a complex puzzle out here made up of so many membranes. It's, it's very critical part of the ear. First of all, we have these semicircular canals. And as you can see that there are three of them which are perpendicular to each other as if they are the representing the X, Y and the Z axis and there's a reason behind it. But we also have the cochlea which is spiral shaped and finally we have the sacculus and the utriculus that is at the base of the semicircular canals out here. The functions are as follows. First of all cochlea, well as I said the vibrations which are transmitted, transmitted, transmitted and finally through the oval window it enters the cochlea and in the cochlea there are some there is some fluid called the endolymph and the perilymph and when they vibrate there are some sensory cells called the organ of cotti and when they vibrate they produce electrical impulses which are sent with the help of this auditory nerve to the brain and the brain then interprets these electrical impulses as sound. Now the semicircular canals are responsible for something called dynamic balance. You see, they have some fluid inside it. So whenever you move, the fluid inside it moves. And since they are in three axes, X, Y and Z axis, they give you a three dimensional perception of how you are moving. For example, even if you close your eyes and you rotate yourself, you jump up and down, you know in which direction you're moving, thanks to the semicircular canals. In fact, if you keep rotating, and then suddenly come to a stop, you feel a bit dizzy because the fluid inside these semicircular canals will keep moving because of inertia. So your brain kind of thinks that you're still rotating. That's what causes the confusion. So you can see that the ears, the inner ear is a very important part of your perception of motion, of your balancing. If this is damaged, then you lose your sense of balance. At the bottom of uh, the semicircular canal. So first of all, we have a swollen part, which is called the ampulla, and that also is involved in dynamic balance. And then further below, we have the utriculus and the sacculus. 
they have sensory cells which help in static balance. That is when you're not moving. Suppose you're just sitting or just standing. Even then you have to, your brain needs to keep checking what is the configuration of your body and which muscles to keep tightened so that you are balanced. Imagine you're a toddler and you are hardly able to walk properly. And then you have to learn the tricks. The brain learns how to control the various muscles and understand how to maintain balance so that you don't fall with your face on the ground flat. So that static balance is maintained by utriculus and saculus. We can hear sound in the range of 20 to 20,000 hertz, but the best frequency for us to listen to is 1,000 to 4,000 hertz. We are most sensitive to these frequencies. Hi students, this is AJ Sir. If you like this video, press the like button. If you would like to enroll for my online test series or online lectures, email me or message me on Instagram. Check the description for more information.